All right, so the fit Z uh, protein um, and its role that it has to play. So let's just say that we have a bacteria here, and so most of you, I'm assuming, probably aren't too familiar with the fit Z protein and its role of forming a Z ring, but um, you are probably familiar with the cleavage furrow that actin filaments form during eukaryotic uh, mitosis and meiosis. And this is a very similar, uh, functionally similar uh, process here. So the fit Z protein forms the Z ring. Um, the structurally, this is an evolutionary precursor to tubulins, uh, which form microtubules. Uh, yet it's, it's somehow contractile. So it's, it's, in terms of the bacterial cell, I want to say it's uh, functionally uh, more related to uh, the cleavage furrow that's being formed, but uh, in terms of structurally, it is more related to tubulin. So let's say that this Z ring here contracts and uh, this bacterial cell is now going to have undergone binary fission binary fission. Binary means like two, like computer code. Uh, fission, nuclear fission, meaning to split. I assume you're all familiar with that terms, but if not, there you go. That's how bacteria reproduce. And they reproduce after it's replicated both of its DNA, giving us two genetically identical uh, bacterial cells. And so that's what that forms there. But, so the Z-ring forms, again, during binary fission, very much like actin filaments forming a cleavage furrow. The point that I'm trying to make there is the one has a functional relation and then it has a structural relation. And it hydrolyzes GTP uh, as its primary energy source instead of ATP. What the advantages of that is, I don't know. I haven't taken so, uh, any type of biochemistry classes yet. Um, and then there's the cytoplasmic protein of the MREB, and this forms a, so let's just, uh, I guess, try to keep this as visually uh, as possible, because I am not good at seeing things when they're just being described here. So here's our bacterial cell, and then a couple of the fimbriae or pelus is there, and then a flagella. Okay, so Mira B, and I'm going to do this in blue here, forms these long helical bands. So these are helical bands here along underlying the plasma membrane. This is the evolutionary precursor to um, the eukaryotic cortex. Keep that word in mind there. And so this is why it's uh, similar to eukaryotic actin filaments. And this guides the cell wall formation um, and plays a role in uh, many other things. But it's for the purposes of this, that's all you're really going to need to know. All right, so let's keep going and talking about this. So let's go back to when we were talking about bacterial conjugation here. I have my nucleoid region here, and I'm a bacterium, and I want to give a plasmid, because that's what bacteria do, to another bacterium. So I'm forming a conjugation bridge here, or a sex pilus, whichever you'd like to say here. Um, what is going to help this get this plasmid move from here to here, from this site here to this site? Well, this protein called PAR-M. It's going to polymerize to move plasmids from anywhere within one cell to another. And so this, I guess I'll do it in blue, uh, polymerize to move plasmids. It's going to polymerize here to move this plasmid in that direction. And then let's just say that this guy has already a, another plasmid, and I'll do that in white, and they're too close together. And you don't want to have that because if they're too close together and they each have their own origin of replication, then the replosomes, the complexes that reproduce that and help it build are going to be too close together and it's not going to know which one to go to. Also, whenever you're talking about uh, transcribing these plasmids and translating them, it's too close together. So you don't want to have your plasmids too close together. And so, uh, again, this PAR-M is going to push those two to opposite uh, poles of a bacterium. So pretty cool. Now let's talk about the bacterial cell membrane. So like all uh, living things that have membranes and non-living things, viruses do have a membrane, but it's termed an envelope in this context, or whatever, you don't need to know that. So they all, in bacteria anyways, have an ester linkage, which is different from uh, their cousins of archaea, and then they have phospholipids. So you all know the story, there's a phospholipid here, this is the fatty acid tail, fatty acid tail, this is the phospholipid part. Well, that's actually just the phosphorus part here. And then there's usually a, I'll do it in uh, blue, some type of a head group. Um, I don't really know too much in the uh, molecular biology of bacterial cells, but they probably do have some form of a head group, and that's generally the structure that we have to work with here. So, um, uh, delete that. So they can have both uh, 
unsaturated and saturated fatty acid chains just like eukaryotes can depending on the temperature uh, on how well they want to maintain that membrane st stability there. Um, and then they also have something called hopanoids, which only about 10 to 20 percent of the bacteria are going to have these, but they're sterol like molecules, cholesterol like molecules. So it's functionally very, very similar to cholesterol. And so, you know, depending on the temperature, if it's cold, it's a, a good way of keeping things intact. And if it's hot, it's a good way of keeping things intact. And so this provides a membrane stability. And so this is therefore going to be much uh, advantageous amongst bacteria. But at the same time, it may be metabolically taxing to have these. So who knows? Further studies are definitely going to be needed. All right, so now let's talk about the peptidoglycan cell wall. And anytime I see a weird Greek word, I always like to break it down into two parts. So peptido, I think peptide, we're talking about a protein here, or a protein linkage. And then glycan, anything with the word gly in it means sugar. So this is a protein and a sugar cell wall. And this, uh, gives, this is what gives a lot of the bacteria its shape, its morphology but also provides a lot of protection against osmotic pressure. If we were to go back to a picture there, I'll just draw it here of a bacterial cell. Well, there's a nucleoid, yeah, there's a couple of plasmids, there's a lot of proteins and stuff floating around in here, ribosomes, vesicles, and things like that. But in comparison to a eukaryotic cell, which is a part of my you know system that does a lot of work to maintain that tonicity, it's really a hypotonic environment. So if I'm put into, like I'm a bacteria and I'm in, I'm in some water and it's a lot of salt water, well, things are going to go from high concentration to low. And so if it didn't have that cell wall there to protect it, it would lice. It would have, you know, a lytic action. Lytic action there. So things are going to go from a high concentration to the low concentration, but the wonderful, and I'll do it in red, bacterial cell wall made of peptidoglycan provide some uh, protection against that. So, cool. Uh, so now let's talk about the bacterial uh, peptidoglycan cell wall. So there's two molecules here, NAG and NAM, that are linked together by a 1 to 4. So when we're talking about like carbons, and I don't know how much organic chemistry you've taken, but if I was labeling all my carbons here of a molecule, I'm going from 1 to whatever. So it's a 1 molecule to the just do it like this for simplicity, one, two, three, four, a one to four beta glycosidic linkage. This is where the glycan portion of the peptidoglycan cell wall comes from. And I like to think of it as this is the plate armor. So if you look at, um, you know, cellulose of plants or chitin of fungal cell walls, they're all beta glucose linkage or beta glycosidic linkages. And this is really, really, really strong. This is where the majority of the strength comes from. And so that's why I refer to it as plate armor. Just for, uh, I guess, in information here, the NAG refers to N-acetylglucosamine, okay? And then the NAM is referred to N-acetylmuramic acid. And the reason why I spelt it with two, you'll make sense of this later, is because it has a, a amino acid uh, pentaglycine, ah, did not mean to do that, uh, amino acid uh, chain falling around it. So I guess if I were to draw this here, this is kind of a cool, interesting uh, picture here. So here's a NAM molecule, and then this is the uh, NAM, this is right here that it's linked to is a NAG. So I'm going to do it in uh, blue. This right here, this is our beta glycosidic link linkage, glyco linkage. So this is from 1 to 4, 1 to 4th carbon. And then this back here though, this is a peptide peptide cross link so this is why i said that there's an amino acid portion of this because this is the cross link that just further reinforces our cell wall okay so which is what we're going to talk about so nam carries a short peptide peptidoglycan chain that can shrink, that can uh, cross-link, reinforcing the cell wall's strength. So if you ever know like anything about medieval armors, but you have your plate mail on top and underneath it you have this thing, chain mail, 
that's kind of how it works. So here's your plate mail, this is really, really strong, and then there's this chain mail that it will bend a lot before it starts to break. So this is what uh, really provides a lot of structural support as well. So let's talk about how this is made. A molecule by the, or a mole integral membrane by the name of bacterial phenol flips the intracellular NAG and NAM linkage. Okay? In the paraplasm, transpeptidase, I wonder what it does, catalyzes the peptide crosslinks. Okay? The reason why I'm going through a lot of stress of pointing this out is that beta-lactam antibiotics, so penicillin, <laughs> uh, inhibit transpeptidase ability at the active site. So this is actually a picture from uh, my my textbook, which I uh, from Wiley Microbiology. I hope I should probably point that out. So here's Nam, uh, and then this is Nag and Nam are connected, and this is all happening right here. So this is the periplasm, and then this is the inside of the cell. Okay, so the initial link here from NAG and NAM, this is our, our beta-glycosidic linkage here, forms from inside by some enzyme path pathway that I don't even, it doesn't say. And then, this is the amazing part, bacteriophrenol flips, think about that for a second now, it flips that linkage there to the paraplasmic side. How it does that, because this is definitely a polar molecule, I have no idea, but that is incredibly impressive. And then so, once it's out here, through a couple of enzymes, we can have further linkages of those beta-glycosidic bonds here, linking these two NAG and NAM molecules together. And then, as I can probably get in, I'll do in red, this NAM molecule here has a linkage with another NAM molecule. So I'm gonna circle these. These are NAM in red, okay? And I uh, will stick to the colors here. And this is NAG in blue, okay? These, uh, I'll do it in green. This region here, this uh, uh, penta, I guess, peptide cross linkage here, this is where our mo the enzyme trans peptid A's works. So this is an enzyme that forms a cross linkage, a transverse linkage of peptides. Uh, and this is what uh, antibiotics uh, such as penicillin can inhibit. So if this doesn't here, if this, this uh, peptide linkage isn't there, it's going to bend. I'm sorry, if the peptide linkage was there, it would bend. But since it's not, it's going to break much easily. And so that way, if you're taking it, the cell wall will literally just crack underneath it because it's, it's very, very strong, but it doesn't bend. So it'll break very, very easily, which is pretty interesting for me. All right, so now let's talk about gram staining.